the Polish-Muscovite War or the Polish-Russian War, in Poland known as the Dmitriads, took place in the early 17th century as a sequence of military conflicts and eastward invasions carried out by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, or the private armies and mercenaries led by the magnates, when the Russian Tsardom was torn by a series of civil wars. The time most commonly referred to in the Russian history as the Time of Troubles, sparked by the Russian dynastic crisis and overall internal chaos. The sides and the goals changed several times during this conflict. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was not formally at war with Russia until 1609, and various Russian factions fought amongst themselves, allied with the Commonwealth in other countries or fighting against them. Sweden also participated in the conflict during the course of the Ingrin War, sometimes allying itself with Russia, and other times fighting against it. The aims of the various factions changed frequently as well as the scale of the party's goals, which range from minor border adjustments to imposing the Polish kings or the Polish-backed impostors' claims to the Russian throne and even the creation of a new state by forming a union between the Commonwealth and Russia. The war can be divided into four stages. In the first stage, certain Commonwealth Shalokta, encouraged by some Russian boyars, but without the official consent of the Polish king Sigismund III Vasa, attempted to exploit Russia's weakness and intervene in its civil war by supporting the impostors for the Tsardom. False Dmitri I and later False Dmitri II against the crown Tsars Boris Godunov and Vasily Shuisky. The first wave of the Polish intervention began in 1605 and ended in 1606 with the death of False Dmitri I. The second wave started in 1607 and lasted until 1609, when Tsar Vasily made a military alliance with Sweden. In response to this alliance, the Polish king Sigismund III decided to intervene officially and to declare war upon Russia, aiming to weaken Sweden's ally and to gain territorial concessions. After early Commonwealth victories, which culminated in Polish forces entering Moscow in 1610, Sigismund's son, Prince Władysław of Poland, was briefly elected Tsar. However, soon afterwards, Sigismund decided to seize the Russian throne for himself. This alienated the pro-Polish supporters among the boyars, who could accept the moderate Vladislav, but not the pro-Catholic and anti-Orthodox Sigismund. Subsequently, the pro-Polish Russian faction disappeared, and the war resumed in 1611, with the Poles being ousted from Moscow in 1612 but capturing the important city of Smolensk. However, due to internal troubles in both the Commonwealth and Russia, little military action occurred between 1612 and 1617. When Sigismund made one final and failed attempt to conquer Russia, the war finally ended in 1618 with the Truce of Julino, which granted the Commonwealth certain territorial concessions but not control over Russia which thus emerged from the war with its independence unscathed. Names of the war The conflict is often referred to by different names, most common of them is the Russo-Polish War, with the more modern term Russia replacing the older term Muscovy. In Polish historiography, the wars are usually referred to as the Dmitriads. The first Dmitriad and second Dmitriad and the Polish-Muscovite War, which can subsequently be divided into two wars of 1609-1611 and 1617-1618, and may or may not include the 1617-1618 campaign, which is sometimes referred to as Chodkovich muscovite campaign. According to Russian historiography, the chaotic events of the war fall into the time of troubles. The conflict with Poles is commonly called the Polish invasion, Polish intervention, or more specifically the Polish intervention of the early 17th century, prelude to the war. In the late 16th and early 17th centuries, Russia was in a state of political and economic crisis. 
After the death of the Tsar Ivan IV in 1584, and the death of his son Dmitri in 1591, several factions competed for the Tsar's throne. In 1598, Boris Godunov was crowned to the Russian throne, marking the end of the centuries-long rule of the Ruriki dynasty. While his policies were rather moderate and well-intentioned, his rule was marred by the general perception of its questionable legitimacy and allegations of his involvement in the orchestrating of the assassination of Dmitri whose death ended the Ruriki line. While Godunov managed to put the opposition to his rule under control, he did not manage to crush it completely. To add to his troubles, the first years of the 17th century were exceptionally cold. The drop-in temperature was felt all over the world, and was most likely caused by a severe eruption of a volcano in South America. In Russia, it resulted in a great famine that swept through the country from 1601 to 1603. In late 1600, a Polish diplomatic mission led by Chancellor Lusapier Haar with Elias P. L. Grimovsky and Stanislaw Warsitsky arrived in Moscow and proposed an alliance between the Commonwealth and Russia, which would include a future personal union. They proposed that after one monarch's death without Hez, the other would become the ruler of both countries. However, Tsar Godunov declined the Union proposal and settled only on extending the Treaty of Jam Zapolsky. That ended the Lithuanian Wars of the 16th century. By 22 years, Sigismund and the Commonwealth magnates knew full well that they were not capable of any serious invasion of Russia. The Commonwealth army was too small, its treasury always empty, and the war lacked popular support. However, as the situation in Russia deteriorated, Sigismund and many Commonwealth magnates, especially those with estates and forces near the Russian border, began to look for a way to profit from the chaos and weakness of their eastern neighbor. This proved easy, as in the meantime many Russian boyars, disgruntled by the ongoing civil war, tried to entice various neighbors including the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, into intervening. Some of them looked to their own profits, trying to organize support for their own ascension to the Russian throne. Others looked to their western neighbor, the Commonwealth, and its attractive golden freedoms, and together with some Polish politicians planned for some kind of union between those two states. Yet others tried to tie their fates with that of Sweden in what became known as the De La Gardi campaign and the Ingrin War. Advocates for a union of Poland-Lithuania with Russia proposed a plan similar to the original Polish-Lithuanian Union of Lublin involving a common foreign policy and military, the right for nobility to choose the place where they would live and to buy landed estates, the removal of barriers for trade and transit, the introduction of a single currency, increased religious tolerance in Russia, and the sending of boyar children for an education in more developed Polish academies. However, this project never gained much support. Many boyars feared that the union with the predominantly Catholic Kingdom of Poland and Grand Duchy of Lithuania would endanger Russia's Orthodox traditions and oppose anything that threatened the Russian culture, especially the policies aimed at curtailing the influence of the Orthodox Church. Intermarriage and education in Polish schools that has already led to successful Polonization of the Ruthenian lands under Polish control. The Polish invasion. For most of the 17th century, Sigismund III was occupied with internal problems of his own, like the civil war in the Commonwealth and the wars with Sweden and in Moldavia. However, when the impostor false Dmitry I appeared in Poland in 1603, he soon found enough support among powerful magnates such as Mitchell Wisniawiki, Lu and Jan Piotr Sapieha, who provided him with funds for a campaign against Godunov. Commonwealth magnates looked forward to material gains from the campaign and control over Russia through false Dmitry. In addition, both Polish magnates and Russian boyars advanced plans for a union between the Commonwealth and Russia, similar to the one Lusapieha had discussed in 1600. Finally, the proponents of Catholicism saw in Dmitry a tool to spread the influence of their church eastwards. 
and after promises of a united Catholic-dominated Russo-Polish entity waging a war on the Ottoman Empire, Jesuits also provided him with funds and education. Although Sigismund declined to support Dmitry officially with the full might of the Commonwealth, the Polish king was always happy to support pro-Catholic initiatives and provided him with the sum of 4,000 zlotys enough for a few hundred soldiers. Nonetheless, some of Dmitry's supporters, especially among those involved in the rebellion, actively worked to have Dmitry replace Sigismund. In exchange, in June 1604 Dmitry promised the Commonwealth, half of Smolensk territory. Many were skeptical about the future of this endeavor. Jan Zamoyski, opposed to most of Sigismund's policies, later referred to the entire false Dmitry I affair as a comedy worthy of Plautus or Terentius. When Boris Godunov heard about the pretender, he claimed that the man was just a runaway monk called Grigory Trepiev, although on what information he based this claim is unclear. Godunov's support among the Russians began to wane, especially when he tried to spread counter-rumors. Some of the Russian boyars also claimed to accept Dmitry as such support gave them legitimate reasons not to pay taxes to Godunov. Dmitry attracted a number of followers, formed a small army, and, supported by approximately 3,500 soldiers of the Commonwealth magnates, private armies and the mercenaries bought by Dmitry's own cash, rode to Russia in June 1604. Some of Godunov's other enemies, including approximately 2,000 southern Cossacks, joined Dmitry's forces on his way to Moscow. Dmitry's forces fought two engagements with reluctant Russian soldiers. Dmitry's army won the first at Novhorod Siverskaya soon capturing Chernigov, Putiv, Sesk, and Kursk, but badly lost the second battle at Dobronichi and nearly disintegrated. Dmitry's cause was only saved by the news of the death of Tsar Boris Godunov. The sudden death of the Tsar on 13 April 1605 removed the main barrier to Dmitry's further advances. Russian troops began to defect to Dmitry's side, and, on 1 June, Boyars in Moscow imprisoned the newly crowned Tsar, Boris's son Fyodor II, and the boy's mother, later brutally murdering them. On 20 June the impostor made his triumphal entry into Moscow, and on 21 July he was crowned Tsar by a new patriarch of his own choosing. The Greek Cypriot Patriarch Ignatius, who as Bishop of Ryazan had been the first church leader to recognize Dmitry as Tsar. The alliance with Poland was furthered by Dmitry's marriage with the daughter of Jerzy Masich, Marino Masich, a Polish noblewoman with whom Dmitry had fallen in love while in Poland. The new Tsarino outraged many Russians by refusing to convert from Catholicism to the Russian Orthodox faith. Commonwealth King Sigismund was a prominent guest at this wedding. Marina soon left to join her husband in Moscow, where she was crowned his arena in May. While Dmitry's rule itself was nondescript and devoid of significant blunders, his position was weak. Many boyars felt they could gain more influence, even the throne, for themselves, and many were still wary of Polish cultural influence especially in view of Dmitry's court being increasingly dominated by the aliens he brought with himself from Poland. The Golden Freedoms, declaring all nobility equal, that were supported by lesser nobility, threatened the most powerful of the boyars. Thus the boyars, headed by Prince Vasily Shuisky, began to plot against Dmitry and his pro-Polish faction, accusing him of homosexuality spreading Roman Catholicism and Polish customs, and selling Russia to Jesuits and the Pope. They gained popular support, especially as Dmitry was visibly supported by a few hundred irregular Commonwealth forces, which still garrisoned Moscow, and often engaged in various criminal acts, angering the local population. 
On the morning of 17 May 1606, about two weeks after the marriage, conspirators stormed the Kremlin. Dmitry tried to flee through a window but broke his leg in the fall. One of the plotters shot him dead on the spot. At first, the body was put on display, but it was later cremated. The ashes reportedly shot from a cannon towards Poland. Dmitry's reign had lasted a mere ten months. Vasily Shuisky took his place as Tsar. About 500 of Dmitry's Commonwealth supporters were killed, imprisoned or forced to leave Russia. The Second Polish Invasion Tsar Vasily Shuisky was unpopular and weak in Russia and his reign was far from stable. He was perceived as anti-Polish, he had led the coup against the first false Dmitry killing over 500 Polish soldiers in Moscow and imprisoning a Polish envoy. The civil war raged on, as in 1607 the false Dmitry II appeared, again supported by some Polish magnates and recognized by Marina Masic as her first husband. This brought him the support of the magnates of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth who had supported false Dmitry I before. Adam Wisniawiki, Roman Rosinski, Jan Piotr Sapieha decided to support the second pretender as well, supplying him with some early funds and about 7,500 soldiers. The pillaging of his army, especially of the Lysochisai mercenaries led by Alexander Lysovsky, contributed to the placard in Sergeyev Passad. Three plagues, Typhus, Tartars and Poles. In 1608 together with Alexander Klechkovsky, Lysochisai, leading a few hundred Don Cossacks working for the Commonwealth, ragtag Shalokta and mercenaries defeated the army of Tsar Vasily Shuisky led by Zachary Lyapunov and Ivan Korvinsky near Zara Isk and captured Mikhailov in Kolomna. Then Lysochisai advanced towards Moscow, but was defeated by Vasily Bartolin at Medvyazy Brod, losing most of its plunder. When Polish commander Jan Piotr Sapieha failed to win the siege of Troitsi Sergeyevalavra, Lysochisai retreated to the vicinity of Rachmanzievo. Soon, however, came successes at Kostroma, Soligalish and some other cities. Dmitry speedily captured Karachov, Bryansk and other towns. He was reinforced by the Poles, and in the spring of 1608 advanced upon Moscow, routing the army of Tsar Vasily Shuisky at Volkor. Dmitry's promises of the wholesale confiscation of the estates of the boyars drew many common people to his side. The village of Tushino, about 12 kilometers from the capital, was converted into an armed camp where Dmitry gathered his army. His forces initially included 7,000 Polish soldiers, 10,000 Cossacks and 10,000 other soldiers, including former members of the failed Rockers of Zebridovsky, but his force grew gradually in power and soon exceeded 100,000 men. He raised another illustrious captive, Fyodor Romanov, to the rank of Patriarch, enthroning him as Patriarch Villaret, and won the allegiance of the cities of Yaroslavl Kostroma, Vologda, Kashin and several others. However, his fortunes were soon to reverse, as the Commonwealth decided to take a more active stance in the Russian civil wars.